In this video, we'll discuss the microscopy parts of A2.2 on cell structure, and this is part of the standard level or core content. Part of the cell theory says that all living things are made up of one or more cells. The way that scientists came up with that is they looked at lots of different types of samples, plants, animals, fungus, lots of organisms underneath of microscopes, and all of them had these small units called cells. And so through inductive reasoning, we can then um, confidently say that all living things are made of cells. So this is a light microscope, and we have to know how to use one of these. Now, they are going to have two or more lenses, and so we'll see them here in two spots. So we have a lens up here in the eyepiece, and then we usually have a set of interchangeable lenses here that have different magnifications. So we can get up to a thousand times magnification with these light microscopes. You need to be able to use a light microscope create a microscope mount, and calculate magnification and actual size of images. So let's do a worked example here. I like to use what's called the magnification triangle. And this tells me what I need to do mathematically in order to find something. So for example, let's start with this scale bar down here. So we will see scale bars on a lot of different images, and scale bars are uh, lengths um, that represent a distance uh, in real life, right? And so the way that I would use these um, is I would have to use my ruler and first measure the length of the scale bar. And when I do that, I find that it is 15 millimeters in the size of my image. So what I can use scale bars for is to find magnification. And if I want to find magnification, I'm going to need to take the size of the image and divide it by the actual size. So the size of the image in this case would be the 15 millimeters and the actual size is the five micrometers. That's how big it is in real life. I cannot divide these numbers yet because these units are not the same, but I can convert them. So there are a thousand uh, micrometers in every millimeter, so that means 15,000 micrometers is equivalent to this 15 millimeters. Then I can uh, simply divide these because now I have uh, similar units. So these units will cancel out and I'm going to get a magnification of 3000 times. You can either include this X as a unit or leave it off. Magnification doesn't really have any units. Now that I know that this image has been magnified 3000 times, I can use that information to find something like the diameter of this cell. So I would want to, again, get out my ruler and find the diameter of that cell. And let's say when I do that, that it's something like 40 millimeters. Now I can go back to my magnification triangle again. In this case, I want to find the actual size of that cell. So I will take the size of the image and divide it by the magnification. In this case, the size of my image, I measured that with my ruler, is 40 millimeters, and the magnification, which we calculated earlier, is 3,000 times. And when I do this on my calculator, I'm getting 0.013 repeating, and that is in millimeters. It's worth noting your numerical answers should always be between one and 1,000. If they are not between one and 1,000, you need to convert your units. The next smallest unit is micrometers, and there are 1,000 micrometers in every millimeter. So if I multiply that by 1,000, I'm getting about 13.3, again, repeating micrometers. And so this is a great example of how to use both the magnification triangle and scale bars to help you find the actual sizes of objects. 
Now, light microscopes have been around a really long time. They didn't always look like this one. Uh, the first ones actually used a candle, um, and they're really great for a lot of things, but there are limits to what they can do. They have a relatively low magnification, so like how far they can zoom in, and a relatively low resolution, that's how much detail you can see when you compare them to more modern types of microscopy. So there's some limitations there, but there are some drawbacks to using using these new fancy electron microscopes, um, which is that electron microscopes are only going to be in black and white, okay? And we have to kill the sample in order to use an electron microscope. So if you want to look at your pet <laughs> under a microscope, you should use a light microscope. We can look at living things there. Um, anything that we're using electron microscopes for, we'll have to kill that sample first. And in this image, we can really see the difference between what we're able to get in a light microscope and what we can get with more modern techniques. And this image utilizes something called fluorescent stains and immunofluorescence. So when we say fluorescent, we mean something absorbing light and then re-emitting it at a different wavelength, and that often brightens it. Immunofluorescence is exactly what it sounds like. It uses antibodies to bind to different structures. So if I have one type of structure, one type of antibody will bind to that structure. And if I have a different structure, a different type of antibody will bind to that structure. Then the fluorescent stains different stains tend to stick to different antibodies. They have different little sticky regions here. And so you can start to see how I might get a picture like the one that we're seeing here where different stains stick to different substances. And it's really useful for identifying different structures and different compounds in cells in a really clear, colorful, visual way. Now, sometimes it's not the content that we wanna see, what types of molecules or compounds are there, but the actual three-dimensional structure. And for this, you might want to use something like freeze fracture electron microscopy. And it's exactly what it sounds like. So you rapidly freeze a sample, and then you use a steel blade to fracture that sample, and it's going to break apart at its weakest point. You can remove some of the ice, and then a vapor will attach to the surface, creating a replica of the surface that you can then view in an electron microscope. And this is really helpful for understanding things like membrane structure. If you study different membrane models, you may be familiar with this freeze fracture imaging. Um, so it's a great way to understand how the structure um, of different cells uh, is put together. And the last one we'll mention here is cryo-EM or cryogenic electron microscopy. And this is a super revolutionary technique for understanding protein structure. And it's also a great example of how we utilize computers in biology as well. So you freeze a layer of proteins and then when you view it underneath of the microscope, you're able to import that image into a computer. That computer will use tons of those images that you have, and it will start to look for patterns. You can even see individual atoms. And this is so great because other forms of electron microscopy, they're only going to be able to view proteins in their most stable form. With this technology, we can actually view proteins in lots of different forms. And so it was really a breakthrough in understanding how proteins change their shape or conformation um, when they're interacting with things. And so for the first time, we were really able to see protein movement in real time. And there'll be a lot of cool advancements here. This is a rapidly evolving uh, area of science. So exciting stuff.